All right, hey, it's, uh, it's Joel from The Hack Life, and I'm here with Dr. Bill Lewinsky. Dr. Bill Lewinsky is a leading behavioral scientist whose work has focused on the intensive study of human dynamics involved in high-stress, life-threatening encounters. He has a PhD in police psychology and is a professor emeritus of law enforcement at Minnesota State University, Mankato, where he taught for more than 28 years and was the law enforcement program director and also the chair of the Department of Government. Dr. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you, pleasure to be here. I, I, I've been following your work for years and um, just so you know, that intro, like for people that don't know you, that doesn't even do it justice. Like you do so much more than that. Um, and I, I appreciate you so much, just so you know. Um, to start things off, I thought it'd be fun to just kind of tell everybody like how you got started and, and you know, what, do you remember, was there a day or anything that you remember specifically? Like, you know what? Yes. This is what I want to devote my life to human dynamics in like police involved incidents. Joel, first of all, it's a pleasure to be uh, appreciated. <laughs> that's, that's number one. <laughs> um, number two is, uh, I was working with the Manitoba Department of Education um, as a psychologist and happened to do a lot of work with community outreach with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And it was January of 1976 and the most dramatic hostage situation in Canadian history occurred on a Manitoba prairie. And I was called in to assist the Royal Canadian Mounted, Mounted Police in the negotiations for that. And I spent a week directing the negotiations for uh, the eventual resolution of that hostage situation. I saw such dramatic commitment, such professionalism on the part of the uh, officers involved. And there was so much pain and tragedy connected to that situation. I decided that if I could do something to make a difference in that, I would. And I kind of changed my direction and started focusing on the human performance elements of police work. And I eventually ended up in a law enforcement program at Minnesota State. And I was teaching there for about two years and I started to get involved in some of the practical, what we call the clinical elements, communication, uh, teaching force, those sorts of things. And what I found was there was no evidence for why we were teaching what we were teaching. And there was no evidence, even though we were university-based, there was no evidence for how we were teaching what we were teaching. It was just up to the professors. And most of them, even though they were teaching what we would now term clinical skills, meaning things that involve decision-making and skillful application of knowledge or tactics or whatever, it was still very much taught as an exam, uh, a regular lecture class and taken with a multiple choice exam which is a tragedy, just a tragedy. And even to this day, most of our education system for police in the state of Minnesota is classroom based, even though we see law enforcement as a profession that is primarily a communication and decision making profession that also has the capability of bringing force to a problem. Uh, so there are three components here that are really critical. And we need to teach a lot about. Uh, and there was no evidence for how we were doing that or what we were teaching. And so we started to do research on that, which has been vastly misunderstood. But we started to do research, for instance, on how quickly threats evolve and whether or not you could establish contact and build a rapport with somebody and then influence and persuade them. And that's kind of like, uh, you know, if you were to study the coronavirus, Nobody would accuse you of promoting the virus because how do you understand a solution to something if you don't understand the problem? And so we started looking at the speed with which events evolve, not from the point of view of challenging officers to be faster at something, but from the point of view of really understanding the type of circumstance they get into and how we can best train them to contain, control, and manage those so everybody's effective. And that research has kind of been going on for a very long period of time. You know what, something that just struck me as you were talking, I was thinking, 
you had this epiphany many, many years ago. <laughs> and you've, you're doing an amazing job with all your, your studies in science. It, it just kind of occurred to me, like, is anybody else even doing this? It doesn't seem like anybody is, has embarked at least as deep as you have or has even tried. It's, it's, it's interesting. And, and part of it is because of the uh, psychological philosophy that I come out of. Uh, one of it, uh, one of the foundations is the psychology of Alfred Adler. And a foundational principle is to see what you're looking at as holistically as possible. And if you look at how people study law enforcement today, it's in thin slices. Nobody sees the integrity of the profession as a whole and the officer as a whole. And that's always been our perspective. It, it is a full dynamics which allows us to do an interplay between, for instance, some of our latest research is studying the activity of the right orbital frontal lobe of the brain as it's connected to the amygdala. It's got a direct connection to the amygdala, the emotional arousal system uh, of, of the brain and the body, and how focus of attention has a profound effect on regulation and utilization of emotion, which is critical because we see officers all the time get in high stress situations and we have not taught them how to effectively regulate their emotions. We've talked about how to lower it, but the question is, how do you use it? And that regulation is ruled by the frontal lobes and the visual process and the emotional intensity. And so we're able to play with that because we've done studies on the eye and we've done studies on the brain. We've done studies on motor skills and the acquisition of motor skills. We put all that package together. As you, as you point out, nobody else puts that package together. And I, 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 don't, I don't know, you know, uh, about 15 years ago, universities started looking at the best way to do research is to start to work with other disciplines so we understand the value of what we're doing in relationship to other areas. And they're starting to do interdisciplinary research. We've been doing that for 30 plus years. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that kind of carves us out, as you say, as a very unique in the law enforcement profession. Huge, huge. Um, you know, what, what do you think um, in terms of, of the public, you know, what do you think is like probably one of the biggest misconceptions when officers use force? Do you think, is there like anything that like jumps out at you that's like an overall theme? Well, one of the things that's really consistent and it's consistent with our research. It's consistent with what I'm observing in the, in the general public. And we, we've done, for instance, uh, in a study, and it's, it's only a minor study. Uh, it, it would be called a pilot study. It involves 400 university students, eight different universities, a variety of different majors in the universities. And we asked a variety of questions on force, including a shot cadence, um, fall time, if an officer shoots somebody once, do they fall down dead? Uh, if they do, how long does it take? You know, kind of so, so you kind of understand some of the human performance dynamics of an officer involved use of force. And, and across the curriculum, doesn't matter what discipline people were studying or where we were, Minnesota or Florida or anywhere in between, the students as a whole had a really exaggerated occurrence rate of police use of force, and particularly deadly force. And I think we know where it comes from. Uh, I mean, if I watch LA SWAT, it's like one out of three or four callouts are shooting somebody. <laughs> yeah. If I watch uh, NCIS, I mean, just about every time they leave the office, <laughs> they're, they're involved with some sort of shooting or death, if not, if not multiple shootings over the course of the incident. And the realities are, uh, and I'll give you studies, uh, three studies, two different countries, Canada and the U.S., involving 20 million citizen contacts. Wow. Okay, so that's, that's a lot. And the use of force overall is a fraction of a fraction of 1%. In fact, 
in all arrest situations, which is when officers are most likely to use any type of force at all, yeah. it, it is less than 1% on all arrest situations. And wow. deadly force is a fraction of 1% of that 1% of force that's used overall. So compare that with what the population thinks is police use of force. And you wonder like, how did that gap get to be so big? Why do people not know what cops do? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that raises an interesting issue because when civilians try to provide solutions to a problem, oh boy. they don't know what the problem is. And, and those who have studied only isolated units about the problem, like the current researchers who will come in and they might study racial bias, for instance, or they might study a uh, use of force, or they might study um, some other element, the environment in which things occur. They're studying a slice of the pie and nobody's looking at that whole pie to really see and really define what that problem is and how we can be more effective in addressing the issue. Yeah, really looking at it from this holistic approach, right? Instead of this, you know, in these silos, just very narrow. Right. One of the things uh, that you brought up, and I think is very interesting, and I, and I know you've done studies on it, is you had mentioned like the number of rounds fired. We always see in a lot of incidents, the public, there's a lot of outcry when they're like, well, it was just so many rounds that the uh, officer fired, like 10 rounds. It was just excessive. And I know you've done studies showing like what you said is how long it takes for an actual um, a body to, to drop from the air and, and actually to the ground. And can you kind of talk about maybe shot cadence or, um, you know, that amount of time for like the, someone's brain to perceive that the threat has ceased? I'm going to do a bit of a, a preamble first because it, it explains why we got in, into this. And one of the things we found, and we may want to go there later, uh, okay. but one of the things we found is that um, we spent a lot of money on academy training. Um, in, in the United States, the average to have an officer from the initial submission of hire to ending the academy is somewhere in the realm of over $100,000. Wow. And we have done uh, studies on the effectiveness of academy training. <laughs> and you, you, know, you know where I'm going. I already know where this is going. Yes, I can't wait. We spent a million of our own dollars, made 10,000 videos on skill acquisition and perishability. And we found and we did that on three major state academies. These, this group of people that we have tested in three states are primarily responsible for providing all of the training for every officer in their state. And some officers, after they graduate, will get an FTO program, uh, some clinical sort of in-service uh, in civilian language, or they, um, they may get um, uh, some sort of a field training program uh, or they may get some sort of, uh, get hired by another larger agency uh, that may provide some extra training. But for the most part, it's here in the state. And what we found was that by the time officers graduate, <clears throat> it didn't matter what they were uh, being taught, communication skills, arrest and control skills, firearm skills. The skills were basically non-functional by the time the person graduated. In, in fact, with firearm skills, um, well, we were looking at, uh, particularly in one department, uh, by the time the officers were finishing the FDO program, at common gunfight distances, they were 10% better for all the training and all the dollars that had been spent on firearms. They were 10% more accurate at gunfight distances than someone that had never had a gun in their hand in their life. <clears throat> wow. wow. <clears throat> so, that, that, now, when we look at physical skills, the physical skills are in the realm of, and by the way, when you use a physical skill, <clears throat> excuse me, there's usually a critical stage, a critical component 
For instance, if you're going to take away a uh, firearm, someone's got a firearm pointed at you and you go to uh, take the firearm away, um, you, there are, depending upon the techniques, there are certain things you have to do. But, but what's important in all of them is you have to make contact with the firearm or the hand. Six months after graduation, only 28% of the class, when they made the start of the move, made contact with the gun or the hand. Nothing you do after that matters. So, yeah. And when we, You're dead. when we looked at swinging a stick and impact tool, it was also about that, about 28% effectiveness in the use of the tool. So when we look at, at the skill, we need to look at how automatic we make that skill because that skill has to be brought to a level that it can be done to the point, just like driving, where everything you do with the car is automatic. And now your brain is free to engage in the drive, in the uh, interaction on the roadway with other drivers and so on. And so therefore, uh, you can now engage actively in the dynamics of the encounter, start what you're doing effectively, stop what you're doing effectively, regulate the cadence of what you're doing. So one of the things we have done as part of understanding all of that is to look at the cadence of gunfire, time to start and time to stop with the officer and kind of compared it a bit with some of their own levels of self-confidence and, um, and their, their basic skill level. What we found is that the average officer firing rapidly with today's handgun, and by the way, the average civilian believes that officers fire at a cadence about one shot per second. So for five shots, it's five seconds. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005. So when they hear that, oh my God, there's been five shots fired, or 10, they're thinking, 10 seconds, five seconds. And we know that with today's handgun and with the level of training that officers have, and by the way, uh, a Glock handgun is a standard handgun. We rigged it up with accelerometers uh, and uh, now we've got accelerometers and gyroscopes and all sorts of tools we're working with. But at the time we rigged it up with an accelerometer, meaning we could break that trigger pull up into a thousand discrete units uh, and we sampled it every seven one thousandths of a second. So we have really accurate data on this. And the average cadence of gunfire is a quarter second around. So five seconds realistically fired by an officer rapidly shooting to save their life takes one second. So it is like <laughs> five times faster than the average civilian would give them credit for. And it's another gap in the understanding between what this profession does and what the civilian world thinks they do. Huge. It, it's, it's huge because uh, how much can you see and observe in one second if you're not trained as well as you should be to the point of automatic and you're shooting rapidly? If, and, and by the way, the in California, we have, it is known that we have such little workspace that you cannot drive a car and talk on a cell phone at the same time because you can't do both very well. Well, right. think about we expecting officers to use a gun to save their life and to do it automatically and simultaneously make tremendous judgments about the use, the duration of gunfire, what the person is doing, all the rest of it. And so we're looking at the relationship between the skill between the vision, judgment, training, and that sort of thing, the brain issues, and how automaticity is built in all of that. And one of the significant discrepancies we're finding is that the civilian world thinks that police officers make great decisions and have a lot of decision training. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, we know that. You know where I'm you going. Know you, you know what I find uh, amazing, though, even even 
even with the lack of training and understanding and decision making, at the end of the day, m the majority of officers, they want to do a good job and they really try to do a good job. And you even said in the beginning of this interview that deadly force is like use what out of 20 million people, it's like 0.1%. And actual use of force is like 0.001%. Almost never. Right. Never. Right. So even without these critical skills that these officers are not getting in the in a, in an average academy, they're, they're still doing their best not to use force Correct. or use it dis discretion, you know, with some discretion. Right. You know, one of the things I found, Joel, is that, and I've spent a lot of time in this profession. I've been in squad cars from elite units with LA to Montreal homicide to London Met uh, pursuit drivers. <laughs> it's uh, Northern Ireland. Um, spent a lot of time in this profession. And one of the things I have come to, and it's very close to my heart, is I've come to have a tremendous respect for the people that wear the uniform. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's amazing. And <clears throat> one of the difference between this profession and any others uh, is that in your profession, everybody can hold up a diploma, a certificate that says, at some point in my career, I proved that I was mentally healthy. <laughs> and nobody else can right. do that <laughs> in any profession. Yeah, because you have to pass a psychological test just to get in and a background yeah. check. And, and then we put you through all sorts of screening process. Uh, and it's a darn good thing because we sure don't provide you with the kind of training you deserve to do the type of job that we're going to hold you eventually accountable for. Uh, and, and we point out the weaknesses. But as you're pointing out, boy, there's a lot of strengths up there. And one of those is we hire good people who do a heck of a job despite what we handicap them with. Yeah. Amen. You know, one of the things you were talking about and uh, you, you touched on is the inadequacy of our training. And I remember watching one of your presentations, you were talking about how the average high school like athlete or football player has like 460 something hours of training under their belt after like four years of high school football, the average police officer after 25 years of training or, you know, his annual, his academy plus his annual training, it equates to like 150 hours. So the average high school football player is getting way more training in four years than an officer ever will in 25 years. One, that's sad. And then two, what could, what, what should we be doing then what should the majority of our training be so that we can, like you said, they can't after 20 percent of them or 30, almost 30 percent can't even like get a move a gun or out of their move a gun out of the way or use their baton effectively. And I know that you do. You're uh, a lifetime martial artist. I've been doing martial arts since I was 18. And I know like when I do jujitsu and stuff, if I'm not in the mat for like a week, it takes me almost two weeks to get back to like being proficient and like being good and like my timing's on. So I don't know, in your opinion, is it just a matter of like constant training or it's just the, the way officers are being trained is just not correct? Well, we've been often, um, we've been told to emulate the training in the United Kingdom. But we did a study at the request of large police organizational body in the United Kingdom on force training between the UK, Canada, and the United States. And the foundational problem is, is this, if we're going to look at training. It's not just a number of hours, which I'll get to in just a minute, but not a single academy in any country that we were able to measure, get the curriculum from, and, and, and the teaching process, not a single academy taught skills in the way that human beings learn them based on the science of learning. So I, I think that's a major problem to begin with. In the state of California, for instance, you've got instructional courses, uh, but when, when we looked at how people taught, um, 
the, the instructors you point out were enthusiastic, committed, qualified in their discipline. But they didn't understand how the average human being that was in their class learned what they were teaching. And, and there's, a, there's a way you can teach that is most beneficial. So yes, we have limited time. And as you point out, that time is extremely limited compared to what we expect. Because we expect Olympic quality performance. And we really, the average academy in this country provides not the training of a high school football player. Four years. Provides half the amount of training that one year of activity in one sport involves. I, if, if you're looking at force, the average high school player of any sport will play for three months. Uh, and that's, that doesn't include preseason. They will spend 10 hours a week at their craft, including game time and preparation for game time on that day. So it's two hours a day for four days and then another two hours game time. That's 10 hours a week. That's 40 hours a month. That's 120 hours a season. And your average arrest and control techniques taught in most academies in this country run 40 to 60 hours. And we expect Olympic quality performance from one month. It's the equivalent of one month of playing one high school sport yeah. for one season. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. I mean, one would call that expectation psychotic if it wasn't so serious. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I, I'm laughing because it, it's incredible. The, the, we lose, let me give you a number, a comparison number. We lose $1.2 billion a year in civil suits in the top 10 largest communities in this country. Okay, so it's New York, Los Angeles, say, oh, okay, top 10, lose 1.2 billion. That's not everybody, that's only the top 10 in civil suits. Wow. And at least a third of that is connected to use of force and not a penny is connected to advancing training and giving the officer more of what they need that would A, save on civil suits and B, would also save on criminal charges, provide better judgment, help the officer perform safer, make our communities safer. Uh, I mean, it, it's just incredible. For me, that discrepancy is almost psychotic. Yeah. <laughs> um, people yeah. go away and cry after this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just let's just pack our bags and just quit. You know? Forget it. No, you you know what? I see officers every day take the street. I'm truly impressed. You, you know, this day the profession is under more criticism than, than ever, and we're being provided with solutions that really don't help with the problem. Um, yeah. And, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, we know that uh, in certain communities, force is used at, at uh, in some cases, um, a moderately higher rate, and certainly other cases less than it is nationally, okay? And, and the solution to that is anti-bias training, or a solution to that is something. Um, and and I, I encourage that. Uh, when I was teaching at a university, uh, I thought it was really important if our students broke bread and prayed with the people they're going to work with. And I set up a program so our students could go into the homes of minority community members, good people in, in, in the community, and they went to church and they had brunch with them. I, I, I am committed to this process that we need to meet and work with the people that we will police. So I'm, I'm committed to this, but, but listen, in those same communities, you will find in the medical world that those that the community members die at a much higher rate with those medical facilities. And the doctors make more errors in those medical facilities. And the solution that the medical world finds is not to give those doctors anti-bias training, is to increase their clinical skills so they're better at what they do 
uh, and subsequently they make better judgments and to hold them responsible if they do step over that line uh, that it deals with racial animus. Uh, and, and so you, you need to, but, but the problem is when the medical world has a problem, they study the problem before they implement a solution. But in this world, uh, in the police world, everybody knows the solution. To heck with defining the problem. Let's put a solution to it. Uh, and I'm yeah. very concerned uh, about that, that we're wasting a lot of money and, and time because we're not doing anything on science. We're not doing anything on trying to solve the problems that are perceived to exist um, and whether or not they actually do exist. Yeah, no, great point. I mean, you, you see a lot of the training, um, like you said, it's very knee jerk and reactionary. And so it just becomes, it's just a stricter policy or more restrictive policy where officers are limited in like what they can and cannot do. The only, the, the, like you said, these, they are just more coercive policies, but no one's getting to the root cause of the problem, which is how do we, how do we form better decision makers? How do we put them in, increase their training? So we put them in situations that they're just less likely to even um, get in a force use of force scenario. You know, how do we mitigate some of these things? Sure. Yeah, you're, you're right on track. You know, if, if you look at how you learn constitutional law, criminal procedures, it was in a classroom situation and you took a multiple choice exam. <laughs> yeah. Those are the guide rules that you will run your professional career off of. And you're taking a multiple choice exam. And there's not a single profession that does that that gives people their critical decision-making components in a classroom lecture situation and a multiple choice exam. And so how many real world decisions do we actually provide to people? You know, in the state of Minnesota, for instance, which is where we're currently housed, we've got a, a training center in Illinois and, and a main office in, in Minnesota. And the average officer in Minnesota will get three deadly force decisions on a simulator before they before they leave training. I, That's it. I, it's, You're trained. Yeah, yeah. The use of deadly forces is so is so rare. But when you do have to make it, you better be really good. And you know what? Three decisions made five years before. <laughs> <laughs> it really doesn't help you. There are so many changes. Science, uh, science of learning has really advanced considerably uh, in, in the past 20 years. Uh, and it hasn't migrated its way into the academy. And we really need to, need to take a look at what are the circumstances and what do we need and how can we build it? And, and those three pillars haven't been uh, researched or developed yet. Yeah, crazy. Um, I wanted to ask you, I, I, or I, I know some of you know you've done a, you do a lot of studies um, within human dynamics and how uh, officers react and perception time, like you said. And one of the things I know that you've talked a lot about in your training is that. A suspect can, on average, produce a firearm from a hidden position and fire that weapon in about 0.25 seconds, right? Correct. However, the human brain, it takes the human brain, which you refer to as P300, so 0.3 seconds, basically, for the brain to even recognize that Oh, that's a gun being pointed at me. I need to do something. I need to react. I need to move, whatever. So by that notion alone, officers are always behind the reactionary curve. Right. So I guess a question is, one, is does this kind of explain for people and, you know, citizens that, that don't know a lot about law enforcement – why when officers see someone maybe reaching into their waistband or making some kind of 
furtive gesture that they think might their hands are being concealed. So, and officers, you know, they get they get spooked about that because they know that uh, someone can produce a weapon of of some nature. Is that why we see officers maybe what some you know citizens might think jumping the gun or shooting before because they know in their head they don't have enough time to react. The only time they can react is by the time they're being shot at, essentially. Mm -hmm. it, it's a it's a heck of a problem, and it's one that we have we have long been challenged with, and that's why we started to to measure this, uh, is because what truly is the speed with which assaults can occur, and if you don't understand that, then you cannot develop response techniques to it. I want to take you into another dimension. That's the edge weapon dimension. We have put accelerometers and gyroscopes on individuals and measured the speed. And we're in this study now, uh, and it's being run for us out of the university in Utah. Now, accelerometers are the speed with which something can occur. So we're looking at four different type of edge weapon attacks. We're looking at the ice pick, saber thrust, the slash, and the palm blade. And all of those assaults, with the exception of the butterfly, the slash here, and all of the other attacks are under one-fifth of a second, 0 0.20. Okay? The butterfly cut, which is here and then back the other way, uh, as is characteristic of Filipino or Malaysian uh, type of knife fighting, uh, yeah. that takes about a quarter of a second. So, uh, to match that, you, you said a third of a second. I'll give you a tighter reaction time. Usain Bolt, coming out of the starting blocks when he set the world record in 100 meters, reacted to the sound of a gun in 18 one hundredths of a second. That's two one hundredths of a second faster than the average time of a knife cut. Uh, in fact, our, our stab, our, our knife thrust, uh, we've measured as fast as one-tenth of a second, almost half the reaction speed of Usain Bolt. Now, where we're going with that is if somebody's in close with an officer and the officer believes they're going to be slashed, how much time does the officer have to react? You're talking a third of a second. Do you know that four times more people are killed with a knife that are, that are killed by all rifles that are used to kill all citizens in the U.S. in a year? Knives are dangerous. And what we have learned from this study is not a single thing we're teaching in the academy helps prepare officers for that type of attack, the speed of that attack. Everybody looks at the 21-foot rule. But in our world, you can be cut out to five feet in a third of a second. The person will cover the distance and be able to cut you out to five feet in a third of a second. Wow. They will cut you out to nine feet in two thirds of a second. The time it takes me to say, one dog, <laughs> just a little over that. You, you can be cut out to nine feet. So when we look at guns or knives or whatever it is, the average human, whether it's pulling a gun from the waistband and fire, bootleg position firing down by, by the thigh and firing out the driver's door, the passenger door, all of that is a quarter to a half a second, depending upon what the person is doing and whether they're sighting. So when we look at this stuff, we look at physical attacks and edge weapon attacks, what are we teaching in the academy and how well do we need to teach that to help give the officer, as you've learned, confidence and competence in their techniques? Because right now we're not building that. We're building check the box training. Yep. And people have a false belief as to how effective their techniques are. And subsequently, they don't know how to compensate to make them more effective. <laughs> <laughs> And that's really where we're at. We, we don't want citizens to be injured by police, urgent behavior, thinking they've got to respond. We're, we're really looking, how can, we, how can we help the officer prepare? Because when the officer gets into that situation, 
the Supreme Court says, I mean, it's not us, Supreme Court says, based on their perception, they've got to do something. Yeah. And, and they will do the best thing possible. And so you're absolutely right that they officers often face decisions in the situation that occur so quickly, there's little they can do to prevent it. And that's where we often get these um, reactions that may or not later be proven to be reasonable or necessary. I wanted to ask you, so given all of that, what can officers do? What's like one thing they can do or what's one thing trainers can do that are training law enforcement to help officers that reactionary curve and, and start to reduce some of those errors? Okay. Well, and as, as you know, we've studied ambushes. We've studied unexpected assaults and what officers tend to do on those unexpected assault situations. And so, A, we need to shape better behavior there. For instance, I'll, I'll give you an example. We're, we're just finishing a study. Uh, it's ready for publication. It's a PhD level dissertation uh, at, at a major university. Uh, and we attacked officers in the middle of a domestic with a weapon assault. And what we found when we charged in on the officer and fired at them was the officer's first response was, and then, then they went for their gun. They delayed their reaction time by somewhere in the realm of a half to three quarters of a second in an area in which reaction time was really critical because they had a startle reflexive response that was not connected to what they needed to do. Certainly if somebody's punching you, a startle response that drives your hands up, as Tony Blower says, could be a really effective technique. But if somebody's shooting at you and you do this, which we have found, we, we found loads of, of that in multiple studies, that we have not paired a reaction that matches the response the officer needs in any kind of automatic fashion. So that's kind of, that's one level at which we can do the training is we can do better skill training. So when the officer's actually under assault, the motor mechanics and movements are better trained and more effective. Overall, however, many officers get into situations where they use force because they perceive something is happening. And my concern is we haven't made them really good diagnosticians. You see, the, the most important part of decision making, uh, and, and if, if this profession is, excuse me, a clinical profession involving communication, and decision making primarily, uh, to which we bring force as one of our, our solutions. Uh, and by the way, it's the only governmental body that brings force to a problem. That's why, that's why it's so important we do this well, is it's got to be good. Uh, and, but the most important part of force is that you do it right when you're supposed to do it. And the most important element there is recognizing when and how to use it, and how you use your professional tools. So, you know, whether we're using de-escalation, can you use de-escalation? Can you establish contact? Can you build rapport? Uh, yes, this person's waving a gun around or a samurai sword. What can you do to contain and control that so you can use communications? Or is a person's assault on someone else immediate or imminent? Th those are all decision processes that the officer really should be skillful in. And when you look at how many of those, let's come back to the academy, how many of those do you get in your pre-professional training or even your in-service training? Name a profession that has a physical impact on anybody that gives as few decision-making opportunities or experiences as law enforcement does. Yep. We don't do it in, in dentistry, we don't do it in medicine, we don't even have, you know, uh, I taught at a university who had a two-year dental assistant course in the basement of the building in which I taught. Those people did a much better job at clinical decision-making and teaching that than we did. And we're sending people out with power to arrest, to take away life, liberty, uh, and dental assistants did a better job at decision-making. And we did, and it's it, it's 
it's uh, again, it's one of those things that's laughable, but I, I, it's just baffling. And so one of the, one of the better things we can do uh, is we can have more decision making in our academies. We can help people recognize and analyze things better. Um, uh, two is we can spend much better time. Uh, I know particularly in California, you have a lot of in-service training and the early stages of that is called your FTO or your field training officer experience. And if we really taught that as a decision-making program versus of this person's been exposed to domestic, this person's been exposed to a sexual assault, this person's been exposed to a robbery, let's look at communication and decision-making skills and great tactical decision skills and positioning and turn that into a full clinical unit. I mean, there are loads of ways we could we could improve this profession without really spending much money if we wanted to kind of really twist it uh, so that we really taught what the officer deserves and what the community expects. Yeah, I, man, I love it. I mean, I'm just soaking it all in because I, I see a lot of the errors in a lot of academies and just like you said, learning is a skill and a lot of uh, academies, you know, segregate all these skills. They're all in silos. You know, you go right. defensive tactics over here and the range is over here. They teach one thing and then driving is over here. It's like, no, we got to figure out a way to integrate all of these and then create decision making around them all so that it's all like one big process. Right, right. It, it is, you know, the academy needs to be integrated, interdisciplinary and clinical meaning they're teaching a lot of decision-making about how to use the other two. And, and we tend not, not to do that. Now, I, I understand we're, we're in a structure, we're in a process in which we've committed a lot of money and time to and values. People have spent their life building this. And so you and I come along and we say, you know, we really need to, to change this a bit. Um, <laughs> you would expect uh, some resistance. Uh, and, and there is, but you know, just about every every line instructor I have ever met since 1975 has been committed to teaching the best they can and to giving that rookie the best they can. And if we can help them in some way get better, I think that's a, that's our challenge. Is um, we, we don't want to say you know, th this is wrong, that's wrong. We have to recognize people are doing their best within it. And in some way, the structure needs to change. We need to realize this is a clinical profession and we really need to treat it as such and give the officer what they need to do the job that we're now holding them accountable for. For instance, if you, if you mandate that, and I don't know what state would do this, that necessity be an important part <laughs> use the force <laughs> that you, you, you know you know what that means for totally restructuring decision making and and the amount of uh, in-service training that would be required to transform the decision process of officers if you were to really do that effectively I mean let's think about it <laughs> it's it's monumental uh, yeah. But it is something that was passed and no officers are expected to do it and they're held accountable. And there's not a single profession that would do it. Let, let, me, let me give you, uh, <laughs> speaking about that, let, let me give you an example. Um, I, I know um, in the state of California, what, what is it, about 800, 900 hours for academy training? LAPD yeah. is somewhere in the realm of 1,600 hours? Yeah. Okay. If you wanted to cut a pet's hair at Petco, you'd get 800 hours of pre-cut training before you were permitted to approach a cat or a dog with shears. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> well, and the funny thing is, you know, I mean, it, it, that's fantastic for Petco, right? That's great. However, <laughs> no one's, they're not in a life and death situation when they're cutting hair. There's no like 
you have to react like no, you know, within a tenth of a second. Point uh, P three hundred. No one's asking someone to react within a third of a second. I don't know. Those Dobermans got a hell of a bite. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's very quick. So hey, let, let's look at plumbers. Let's look at barbers. Barbers in in most states require somewhere around twelve hundred to twenty four hundred hours of classroom instruction and another two to four thousand hours of supervised training. Wow. And if you want to buff nails, it's somewhere in the same category. It's just a darn good thing we hire good people. I, I'm, I'm telling you, because see, yeah. what, what we are doing to give those good men and women what they need, I, it's, it's just not there. And, and my concern today, my concern is that we are hiring people with less life experience. Uh, the, the, the stress that officers are under uh, and the pool that now want to become officers because of the public criticism uh, and in many cases uh, a very prejudiced criticism that's being leveled against the profession. Um, we, we could, some, some departments it's not affecting and other departments are having a heck of a time recruiting. And, and my concern is this would have this is going to have an eventual effect upon the profession. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're already seeing it out here for sure. A um, couple more questions and then we'll start wrapping things up. Um, you know, one of the things that I've really taken to heart with your training and your learnings and your studies is task management and attention being a limited resource for officers. And I think, like you said, really making them aware of that because we see officers in you know high high stress situations that are doing like five different things they're on the radio they've got their gun out they're giving commands and it's just not possible to do all those things well that's uh, correct and i so i i know we st we've been emphasizing and really trying to pre-plan all these things so that by the time you get to the call or you're on scene, you only have one job and tasks are broken up. Oh, that's beautiful. Right. Did, did, and so I think just making officers aware. Right. right. You, you know, um, it, they can do it all. <laughs> in, in our classes, you know that we, uh, we give a uh, simple illustration on workload capacity. For the, for the brain and the attention process. And, and what we do is give a, a very old test. It, it actually developed about the beginning of the last century uh, to test this attentional capacity. And it's digits forward or digits backward. So we'll give you a series of, of numbers, say 10 numbers in a row uh, at about a second pace in between each number. So you can't chunk them. You have to consider each one individually. And the average person can only hold 10 numbers forward in their brain. By, by the time you get to number 11, people lose the whole sequence. Well, that's the limit on your capacity to deal with anything. And uh, if that is the case, then what happens when officers have to multitask, as you point out? It is so much better to have things automatically, to assess the problem ahead of time so you can narrow down what is happening. And uh, functionally, we'll give you a, uh, uh, a study that uh, we did that was just recently published uh, in which we looked at the memory of officers and memory is connected to attention. I mean, it's, it's not direct and it's not 100% all the time that you're attending to. By the way, you can't see most of what you're involved in in life anyway. But when you pay attention to something, it's got a much better chance of entering your, your memory. So we tested the memory of officers dealing with a uh, distraught individual on a traffic stop. And we tested that memory uh, almost immediately after. And there's some problems with that uh, consolidation of memory, emotional arousal, and, and, and the rest of it. But officers who are focused on the communication aspect, trying to cut through the fog of this angry, distraught person who, who was resisting anything they had to say and was disagreeing with them, they could not tell us anything, no, not much to anything about what the person was doing tactically. 
threatening them. Their hands, what their hands are doing, their body position, the, the arousal. They were focused on the face and focused on trying to cut through uh, that type of communication. Officers who were focused on the hands and trying to understand the dynamics and, and what that meant couldn't tell us much about the communication. Now, here's, here's the implications. If you're going to deal with de-escalation with an individual who is really distraught, how can you manage officer safety, control the dynamics, contain and control the surrounding in, uh, environment, deal with the public, and simultaneously effectively communicate and negotiate with someone who is really in a very confused state and doesn't want to listen to you anyway? It, it, is, it is really, truly challenging. And, and we're thinking it's far beyond one, wow. if not far beyond two, or maybe even three officers. Uh, just that situation alone that I described. W one working on the communication, one working on the tactics, and one working on the crowd control or environmental cues and, and the environmental stuff. Now, that would be reasonable. You know, if, if you're really going to manage the situation, it might take three officers because it's way beyond one officer to do all of that. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, officers get into situations, as you're pointing out, that place such cognitive load on them. There's so many things they have to do. Uh, and then we hold accountable, the officer accountable for poor decisions. There's not a profession around that would, in analyzing this situation, would accept that individual responsibility. If you look at NTSB, you look at TSA, you look at any kind of crash, you look at AMA, American Medical Association, look at any kind of, of that type of error uh, in, a, in a surgery, that they would look at the environmental factors, they'd look at the training issues, they'd look at the number of people sent to handle that type of problem. Uh, they would be able to ferret out all, but we send one officer to that type of issue and then hold the officer accountable. If they can't make contact with someone who's dissociated in an altered state of consciousness, uh, armed with a weapon, surrounding environmental cues or threats. I mean, it is, it is, this is one of the most challenging professions uh, that I know of. Wow. Uh, and from a human perspective, um, it, it's truly amazing. We get the quality we get. It really is. That's something yeah. that I find a lot of solace in now, just knowing everything I've learned and the amount of like, like just human performance and like capability to respond effectively, you're always really at a, da a disadvantage. And uh, it amazes me, like you said, the dedication and uh, the people that put the uniform on every day. I really, uh, I appreciate them a lot more, you know? Yeah, well, it, you worked with a, uh, uh, a large department as well, and, and you would get better training than a lot of other offices in the state of California uh, and elsewhere in the US. I mean, there, there are some places where the academy is 400 hours. And yes, and two thirds of the officers in the U.S. get no FTO training on top of that. The, what they'll get is they'll get a two week ride along with the chief uh, that shows them the community, gives them the radar, <laughs> the keys to the squad car and their cell phone number. <laughs> I'm serious. In fact, in the state of Iowa, you can be a police officer with no police training and uh, it can take you a year before you go to the academy and you're still a licensed peace officer. Whoa. 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 Right. So it, it is a, just a darn good thing we hire good people. And it's also a, a good thing that most of our, most of our population are really decent people that we police. And it doesn't matter what community they're just, they're just good human beings wanting to make a living the American way, succeed, yeah, yeah doing their best. And, yeah. and when, they, when cops come in, for the most part, they have been respected and, yeah. and, uh, and, and cooperated with. And now, we're, particularly in some communities, we're not seeing that. We wonder why the violence is going up in those communities. And, and there's, you know, if, if, uh, if fire service came, to put out your house fire and all your neighbors protested and stopped the fire truck from coming. <laughs> 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 the, 
But we're getting that in some communities now, that police right. officer responds to something, gunshots, uh, and they're being blocked from responding to, to the crisis that's going on. Uh, and boy, there's, we have some really serious uh, issues to contend with. But fortunately, most people in this country, it's a lot of respect still out there for, the, for law enforcement. Yeah. But it is one of the most respected professions in the world, much higher than politicians. <laughs> I would hope so. <laughs> Hey, um, what are what are some uh, exciting projects that you're working on right now? Well, as I said, we're we're working on uh, edge weapon issues, and we're trying to get those down. That's an ongoing project, uh, and and that's that includes time to close as well as time to uh, to work the uh, the weapon. And we're very concerned with that because, among other things, it's a reflection of the uh, lack of evidence foundation for the training we have in the academy. Uh, we're also looking, uh, working on a decision process. Uh, we want to create a decision program that really facilitates great decision making in the academy before the officer uh, hits the street, or it could be used in in in-service training. And that's something we've been working on for a long time. And we're going, we're continuing on. Uh, we're getting almost to production stage on some of that stuff, but we we think it's really, really important to teach people how to look and see. Uh, because the expert knows what, where, when, and how something's going to evolve. Just think about you know, any sport you've ever played, uh, including jiu-jitsu. I mean, somebody moves a certain way, your kinesthetic sense, you feel it, and you know, you know what's happening. Uh, versus, yeah. versus questioning, why are they doing that? <laughs> and then it's too late. Right. Yeah, right? It's too late. So it's it's that, that diagnostic assessment that's almost intuitive is is what we need to build, and we're, we're very much interested in that. And within that, we're working with some really good people, uh, literally uh, people that have co-authored uh, journal articles uh, with Nobel Prize winners on the topic on decision-making. Uh, and we're working with, with people who have spent 40 years studying decision-making in athletics and, um, and how they recognize conditions under time-compressed circumstances and then prepare a response to it. Because you really have to go to that. You know, what you're looking at, if, if the assault, the time to draw a gun and fire is a quarter second, what, what can we notice about pre-event cues that might give us yeah. a start on, on, on understanding what's happening and making a better judgment about it? You know, Ted Williams, for instance, was, was a great batter. Uh, one of the few to get over a 400 uh, batting average in, in a year. But he knew somewhere in the realm of 2,000 pitches. He knew literally what every pitcher was most likely to throw that he would face at what point in one inning with what, what outs and what balls and strikes on this batter. Uh, he was a calculating machine. Uh, and, and if we could help officers understand things that way, to understand what the greatest probability is, given what I'm reading, uh, and what I'm seeing, help them become better predictors, better readers at human behavior. So that's really where our interest is and what we're trying to do with this decision-making process. We're continuing to look at speed of assaults and, and that sort of thing and turning issues. And we're very interested. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, it, you know, high-speed motion capture systems that they use with athletes uh, yeah. where they have multiple cameras and it synthesizes all the data in a computer program and then produces an avatar. Yeah. Uh, we have got that with people shooting back, shooting and then coming back. And what is amazing to us, and, and it goes to the direction that coroners should not take the body off the table. They need to talk about shot placement in an anatomically correct position. There was a shooting in Sacramento, for instance, a couple of years ago that turned out to be very influential in your state. And two attorneys, and I won't say who they are, uh, were, were capturing CNN with their own coroner talking, I mean, days after the incident, talking about bullet strikes, and moving the body this way and that. Uh, I'm sorry, that coroner did not understand human dynamics. <laughs> uh, okay, so give me an example. Multiple high-speed camera systems analyzing data, thousands of seconds producing an avatar. 20% of our subjects 
who are pointing directly back and would be shooting back if they were running away from an officer. Their lower lumbar area from the chest to the hips is parallel to the lateral surface. So a bullet would enter a 90 degree entry into their lower back at the same time they were shooting back at the officer. Right. A coroner would say, an attorney would say, the public would say, this person is no longer a threat. Right. They were running away, they're no longer a threat, and the officer shot him in the back at a 90 degree angle. And the human body at that point in time in 20% of the subjects had the arm rotated back and they could be shooting back. And I can't do it, I'm seated, <laughs> I'm over, but these, these young people were very flexible. And so what we're looking at is, we're still looking at those movement dynamics. Because even in, as, as we look at bullet placement, I know this is one of the things you wanted to get to, bullet placement in a, in a gunfight. We expect people to be able to see and read and respond immediately to what's happening. And I'll give you an example. In a sport like football, and let's go to even high school football, or you want to go professional, known athlete, known opponent, right? So well-known, usually even studied. Rules. Everybody operates by rules. Uh, known environment. Referee. In the street, it's none of those. Unknown opponent. Yeah. <laughs> All right? Uh, likely never been in this area before no rules for the opponent rules for the officer right all sorts of it, it's just a challenging and in our in our professional sports at the even at the highest level the player cannot read and predict with 100 percent accuracy what the opponent's going to do that's why fakes work all the time you can't read and react quickly enough so if an officer is going to fire one round and then fire another a quarter second later. We've got consistent head rotations, whether we do it with a video or whether we do it with accelerometers and gyroscopes, downloading data in an Excel spreadsheet at seven one thousandths of a second. We've got head rotations that average 18 to 23 one hundredths of a second on the average person who is shooting and turning. And what that means is if you fire two rounds at me at a quarter second apart, bang, bang, your first shot could theoretically hit me in the front of the head and I will have my body completely turned around a quarter of a second later and the next shot will hit me directly in the back of the head. And until we understand these dynamics and really understand the implications of that and we take that to a forensic analysis of the incident, there are many people that will make their judgments not understanding. The public will make it within seconds. Yeah. And we'll get prosecutors making it within hours. And they will not understand the human performance dynamics. Yeah, wow. And, so and this, is, this is serious. And we come along and we say, well, you know, have you looked at the human performance dynamics? Time to see, recognize, change, stop doing what you're doing. I mean, why do they have an amber at every lighted intersection before red? Because nobody can stop anything immediately. But we expect an officer to stop shooting immediately as soon as something changes. When officers focus on putting a round on target, not with what's happening out here, but shooting accurately to save their life. We expect them to A, see what they're not focused on, B, react immediately, which we would never expect of a driver in an incident. And then what it means is that people make judgments about something based on law and policy or their own misconceptions about something. And then we'll come along and say, hey, have you thought about the human performance factors? Like NTSB, like TSA, like the AMA. <laughs> Have you thought about maybe, maybe including those? So yeah, there's the, this whole profession is really. I, I wish, I wish we were better understood. Yeah, agreed.
God, that was perfect. Um, I want to wrap things up and uh, go into the lightning round of the questions. Are you ready? Okay. If the old you could see the new you, what would the new you say? If the old you could see the new me, what would the old what you the, say? What would the new you say? Oh, um, I didn't know it would be so different. I, what do you I, mean by that? I just I, I had no idea I would be here. I mean, I grew up in the most violent neighborhood and the poorest neighborhood in Thunder Bay, Ontario, and it's still today, it's recognized as the most violent city in Canada. More homicides in Thunder Bay than in any other city in Canada. And I grew up in the most violent neighborhood and it's the poorest. Wow. Uh, and I would, I would, yeah, the, the journey that life has taken me on has been really, really interesting. Yeah. Grateful for you, man. I'm grateful for your your journey and where where you where you've showed up. It's amazing. Thank you, thank you. Um, what what are some choices that you think you made that made you who you are today? Uh, one of the most important uh, is uh, I was extremely uh, sick, had pneumonia three times, uh, debilitating pneumonia three times within two years, um, and was really serious, seriously ill. Uh, and I decided that I didn't like to be like that. I wanted to be different. And this was the fifth grade. And, and I started to work out. And uh, I, I continue that to this day. Uh, it's had a major effect. Athletes, uh, athletic areas, uh, got a university scholarship, uh, went to the Olympic training site in, in Ottawa, um, been training martial arts for half a century. Uh, it's had a profound effect on my life. And I know you know, uh, it, like I do, uh, is it, you've, got to, you've got to test this stuff out. And it's my, it's my personal <laughs> test lab. Um, yeah. it, it's, been, it's been critical for me, uh, both for my health, but also for the insight and the knowledge that has helped me work with, with law enforcement. Yeah, I love that. Who's... Um... Who's someone in your expertise or maybe in your arena that, that inspires you or someone that maybe you even follow today? I've got, I've got three people that are really uh, critical for me. One, one of which was um, one of my early clinical supervisors was uh, chairperson of the Canadian Psychiatric Association and chairperson of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Manitoba. And his name was Harry Prozen. And he had a very infl I mean, other my parents, <laughs> and you know, and that sort of thing. He was he was very uh, he was very important, uh, and um, uh, it's uh, a, a couple of other people, but uh, really Harry's been Harry's been extremely prominent. Uh, one of the people that really helped me um, uh, was one of my uh, two of my high school teachers, uh, and uh, and by the way. Uh, it, it reminds me we can do anything we want today uh, with whatever we want to change what's happening in the minority community. Uh, but one of the things that changed me, uh, that made me different, was uh, uh, two of my high school teachers who believed I had potential uh, and worked with me to get to university uh, on, a, on a scholarship, a track scholarship was the only way that I could, I could get to a university uh, and, and they, they helped me get there. And uh, so they're, they're very, very important individuals, people who care uh, and people want to reach out. And, and by the way, when we look at, uh, even in the 50s, the studies on, on change, change from one level, which at that point was a welfare component. We called it the welfare group. And they looked at the study, 20 year study on transitions from welfare group to, to self-employment and esteem and accomplishment, uh, almost everyone that succeeded said somebody in their life, a police officer, a teacher, said, you can do it. And boy, is that critical. And, and, yeah. and I, I don't care what you, what you do in social policy, it's that one-to-one -one stuff that makes a difference. Yeah, that's so, good. Anyway, so um, teachers, basically, yeah. uh, teachers.
Um, I'm a big reader. Are there any books, like maybe one to three books, that had like a huge impact in your life that you'd recommend other people go out and read? Yeah, there's there's some uh, Japanese texts that you might be familiar with. <laughs> uh, Mimoto Musashi's. Uh, That's the only one I know. <laughs> okay. The rings. Um, there's a great one by Dyson Deshomaru, uh, who actually yeah. links Zen to uh, to combat, and it's it's kind of it's it's really very interesting because much of the stuff that we're looking at now, including the uh, the book by Joan Bickers that I'm going to recommend. Joan helped us put iScan on elite and counterterrorism teams in, in uh, uh, the UK. And we monitored what their eyes were doing in the middle of a conflict situation and why the experts were able to perform better and make much better judgment than the novices. And her textbook is Perception, Cognition, and Decision-Making. Uh, and I certainly recommend that book for anyone that wants to really get into this eye-brain stuff that I think is so critical for training. And the other, is uh, Motor Learning and Performance, sixth edition by Schmidt and Lee. Dick Schmidt uh, used to work with us. Uh, he spent 40 years at UCLA in the Department of Psychology looking at learning. Uh, and Tim Lee currently works with us. And he spent 40 years in McMaster's in Canada uh, looking at human learning and motor performance. And what they have come up with, with how human beings learn, and connecting it to learning systems is really pretty consistent across the whole uh, academy structure. So if you want guidance, those are, those are some great books, the, the last two. Miyamoto Musashi, I don't know how many people would be interested in that. That's you and I are, book. but. Yeah. I haven't heard about the one with uh, the Zen in combat, so I'll have to look that one up. That sounds right. really interesting. Dyson Deshomaru. I'll put that in the show notes when we're done. Okay. Um, last two questions. Any um, I, other than your martial arts, are there any like rituals or practices that you like? You know, some people have like a gratitude journal. Is there anything that you do on a regular basis? Um, what, what, what I do, what really works for me in my life that's really important is the grounding I get on the dojo floor. Mm -hmm. and, and the coronavirus has meant that I'm now on the dojo floor four days a week, running two hour classes on Zoom with my black belts. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's been really critical. The time to come to presence and to work at speed, intensity, skill, reaction time, even on Zoom. I mean, I can do reaction drills with you on Zoom. Uh, wow. And, and prepare, yeah, use, prepare techniques and have you make choices on techniques and we can do it on, on Zoom. It just takes creative practice, but, but it's, it's my place to be centered uh, and to, uh, to wear off the stress. Yep, I love it, I get that. Uh, last but not least, Dr. Lewinsky, if people wanna learn more about you and your work, where can they find you? Uh, well, for science, uh, if they look up forscience.org, and come to uh, come to our website. We've got uh, well, very shortly we'll have about thirty journal uh, scientific uh, publications up. Uh, we've got a four science news that's now in our thousands of publications, which talks about our research. It's up there too. We've got our courses. Uh, we've got interviews with people, videos. It's, a, it's really a very well built out um, website. So we're encouraging you to to go to the website. Uh, and if they want to make contact with me, it's information at forscience.org. Fantastic. Dr. Okay. Bill Lewinsky, thanks for being on the show. Joel, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Really appreciate it. Glad to spend some time with you. I've enjoyed it previously. You're doing great work. And I hope at some point you talk about the work you're doing with your department on this site. <laughs>